Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, welcome back to uh, the afternoon session of uh, the 2014 Japan Update. I'm Veronica Taylor. I have the privilege to be the Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific here at ANU. I'm uh, also uh, fortunate enough to have been a former director of our Japan Institute. And so for that reason, it's a particular pleasure to uh, welcome our keynote speaker uh, for the update, Professor Richard Samuels. Uh, Dick is on his first visit to Australia and it's a particular pleasure to welcome him here to ANU. Uh, he's the Ford International Professor of Political Science and the director of the Centre for International Studies at MIT. Uh, at MIT, uh, he served as the head of the MIT Political Science Department, the vice chair of the Committee of Japan of the National Research Council, and also, for a significant period of time, chair of the Japan-US Friendship Commission. That's the capacity in which um, I first uh, was fortunate enough to meet Dick and uh, we spent some time uh, working together uh, on US-Japan uh, related issues in the US and I can attest to the very high regard in which he's held by public policy thinkers and uh, government officials both in the US and in Japan. He's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and uh, he's also the recipient of the uh, Imperial Honour from Japan, the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star. We've invited him uh, to speak with us today at Japan Update in part because uh, his 2013 book, uh, 311, Disaster and Change in Japan, is one of the uh, most significant uh, works on contemporary Japan uh, to come out in recent years. It's really the definitive work on the combination of natural and man-made disasters uh, that engulfed uh, Japan and continue to affect it um, after the, the 311 events. Um, for those of you who were hoping after lunch to settle in for a carbohydrate-induced snooze, um, I have to disappoint you. Um, Dick's instructions are uh, to be, as he always is, incisive, stimulating and provocative. Um, so you have something to look forward to. It's going to be a stimulating session. We'll follow it with uh, some Q&A. But now uh, let's join in welcoming our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Samuels. Thanks very much, Veronica. This is uh, very frightening. Um, I am, um, uh, this is my first trip to, oh, it's my first trip to Canberra, um, but it is uh, uh, delightful to see so many old friends here from so many different other moments uh, across a, a long period of uh, work on Japan with you. Um, I, I was told uh, that you're interested in change um, in Japan, so for me that means uh, that I should talk about history, and since I'm a political scientist, uh, that means I should talk about political history. And um, I, sh I would start by just noting the obvious, which is that politicians and activists everywhere um, do many things with and many things to history. Uh, they ignore it, they confront it, uh, they invoke it, they debate it, they erase it, they embrace it, they forget it, they interpret it, and above all, they use it, or they try to. Um, now, I've written at some length, uh, and over decades, I have to admit, and, and in several different contexts, about the strategic use of the past to fuel change going forward. Um, it's an old idea. Very old idea, actually. Machiavelli argued that in making real change, leaders, uh, reformers, should maintain the old forms because people are satisfied with the way things appear to be. Um, and and they're, they're more influenced by the things that seem than by the things that are. Uh, that was Machiavelli. But George Orwell picked that up in, in, his, uh, in, in, in his masterpiece in, in 1984. You're probably familiar with this, the, the, uh, the takeaway quote that he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. Um, and we all know how effectively Japanese modernizers understood this. They just, they just understood this, selectively using the past um, uh, to revolutionary ends in the 19th century when they restored an emperor, for example, uh, in an imperial line that had never really exercised much in the way of political power. Um, they used the imperial presence to assert the legitimacy 
uh, of a new ruling elite to replace what had become an illegitimate one. Or later, after the Pacific War, um, politicians reached back three decades to failed ideas, failed liberal uh, ideas about a small and democratic Japan uh, that given the failure of a large imperial and militarist Japan would now have its day. And the best, you know, it's not specific to Japan. Obviously, I started with Machiavelli, but we can go to Abraham Lincoln, um, who created Thanksgiving. I don't know how well that's known here in Australia. I don't know how well that's known in the United States. But that was, that was just a confection uh, put together by Abraham Lincoln at a moment when he saw the house divided during uh, looking at the, uh, at the precipice of a civil war, a house divided that would not stand. So created this myth of Thanksgiving where everyone would come together and so forth. China today provides other examples, even though it's revolutionary and it's post-revolutionary leaders make um, quite a lot, uh, some would say a fetish, out of rejecting, um, uh, some say smashing the past. Uh, there's no more direct connection, it seems to me, between the future um, and the past than in Mao's enormous portrait in front of the Forbidden City. Um, and now uh, Xi Jinping uh, proclaims his China dream, which is the great revival of the Chinese uh, Chinese nation by invoking both Mao and the selfless bureaucrats of the 18th and 19th century, or leaders, I should say, who put the people ahead of themselves uh, and ahead of the state. So he's fighting corruption now and in the future by invoking uh, a past, um, even in China. Okay, so we all know that the use of history can be strategic um, and very selective. And what I want to do this afternoon is uh, call your attention uh, to the ways in which the uses of history, uh, uh, or this use, particular use of history, is being used in contemporary Japan and in uh, Northeast Asia uh, more generally. Um, and I want to do it by examining the three most contentious issues of the past several years uh, in Japan. Um, the first being the catastrophe in Tohoku, which, which um, we talked about at some length this morning. I'm going to return to again at the, on the panel. Um, but the debate about collective security, uh, uh, I should say collective self-defense, and the passage of the recent passage of the designated state secrets law. Um, then what I want to do is explore all this a bit in the context not just of Japan, but of uh, Sino-Japanese relations. So that's, that's my agenda. I don't know if it'll be provocative. We'll see whether you, you take out your torches and you come to burn down my house. But let me start with 311. Thank, thank you, Veronica, for uh, hawking my book. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, what that book is about and what I'll, I'll talk about in more detail on the panel is, is that Japan's national discourse splintered uh, after 311 into three separate historically based narratives. All these political entrepreneurs using 311 uh, to, to say that their version of history or that the, their version of 311's history is the, it provides prescriptions for how things should, should go, uh, for, for what the choices should be going forward. Each was competing for control um, uh, of Japan uh, going forward. Political entrepreneurs have this sense that if they can control the sweet talk that frames public choices, they would use the, hor the horrific immediate past of 311 to identify heroes, to identify villains, uh, and shape that, in that way, uh, national interests, and possibly even national identity, uh, in an effort to tilt the balance of history in their own choosing, in their own preference, preferred direction. And there were many choices available. 311 was, as it turned out, uh, quite plastic in that sense. Some used 311 as a warning that Japan had come too far in the wrong direction and needs to put it in gear and go off in a new direction. For them, history with its collusive nuclear villages and uh, centralized politics had taken the nation too far the wrong way uh, and had to be abandoned, uh, that Japan's national interests would be achieved only uh, by moving forward vigorously beyond, for some, beyond dependence on the United States, beyond, for others, dependence on nuclear power and so forth. For those who had more to lose from institutional change, and there were quite a lot of those, folks, this catastrophe was a once in a millennium black swan. Um, so for them, the, the, the real lesson of 311 was stay the course. Let's keep doing what we're doing. We can do it better. We can do it more safely, but stay the course. History doesn't repeat itself, at least very frequently, and therefore uh, it's in Japan's interest to continue doing what it's been doing, but more wisely. 
And then there were others still who declared that 311 taught the clear lesson that Japan must return to an idealized past, to the way things were before um, things got lost, before Japan got lost uh, to tradition and to globalization. So Japan's interest could only be realized by returning to basic values and rediscovering an essential national identity. So history for this group was, was idealized and very ancient in some respects. Now sadly, uh, I think, for each group, uh, each group's prescriptions for change were no different than the prescriptions that they had before 311 even happened. Um, there's a lesson here, and that's sort of a central lesson of the book. If the opinion leader or if the activist or if the uh, uh, political entrepreneur was anti-alliance before 311, 311 proved he was right. Um, ditto the opinion leader who, um, who advocated reform of the electric power sector or who supported enhancing the military. Only one incumbent political leader, by my count, only one incumbent political leader at the time of 311 actually shifted in a conse consequential way um, in the midst of the crisis, and that was Prime Minister Khan on nuclear power, as you are all aware. And his enemies considered, succeeded in characterizing him as the villain in chief um, in the public imagination. And maybe he was, but he was the only guy whose position on a major issue after 311 couldn't be predicted from his position on a major issue before 311. Um, and I think to the surprise of most of us who, who, who were willing to imagine the event as potentially transform transformative, 311 pretty quickly receded uh, into, and I think firmly remains in the past. Uh, it's not proven to be the transformative event we and, and I think most Japanese anticipated it would become. Japan was not going to be, as a result of 311 alone, was not going to be reborn, reset, revitalized, regenerated, at least not again as, as the result of 311. It, in the wake of 311 then, um, other concerns and other uses of history uh, by political entrepreneurs have taken center stage, sometimes to the detriment of Japan's regional uh, and global position, sometimes to the detriment of its national interest in my view. Um, some on the right, now I'm not talking about all conservatives, but I'm talking about some on the right, um, have been using history as if they were navigating the future through the rearview mirror. They're looking, they're looking through the rearview mirror. Uh, they revise history to paint Japan's mid 20th century empire as less aggressive, um, as less aggressive than as noble. Um, these, the, what we call revisionists have extolled Tokyo's intention to liberate Asia from white colonial rule, uh, the, the call for the reintroduction of patriotism in the nation's schools, undercut the Kono statement on comfort women, um, reject the claim uh, that atrocities were committed on a large and some would say unprecedented scale in Nanjing in 1937, and resist uh, the demands of Japan's neighbors for demonstrations of remorse that go beyond payment and uh, payment of reparations and repeated apologies. So, and, and indeed there's one past that, that they insist on leaving far behind in the rearview mirror, and that's the post-war. Uh, their intention is, in, in Prime Minister Abe's terms, and it's, it's, very, it's a very uh, powerful term, um, it's to escape the post-war regime. So what does that mean? I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff. It means coming to terms with Victor's justice that was imposed upon Japan by the Allies, basically making up the rules as we went along, in his view. It means ending Japan's status as a subaltern state, as a dependency of the United States. And it also means revising a constitution that, it was, that was imposed upon it. And now, I'm not a revisionist, um, but I am actually, uh, some may be surprised to learn, very sympathetic with each of these three um, these three concerns. In my view, I think it would be very good for the United States and for Japan uh, to, to confront openly the terms of that post-war settlement. Um, I think it would also be good um, if Japan could be less dependent upon the United States, um, and especially if the Japanese people could write their own constitution for the first time. All three of these things would really be, uh, I think, uh, would be useful for um, making Japanese democracy, which as I'll report, I think is already quite robust, more, more so. Um, and I should say, it's not at all clear that a revision of the Constitution in, a, in the context of a large, engaged national debate will come out the way the revisionists would like it to come out. In fact, I think it's pretty, pretty certain that it wouldn't. 
so much now for, for how part of the right, not the, all the right again, but part of the right is using, is using history. Not all of it, as I've said, is a bad thing, but driving through the rearview mirror is not strategic. It's not the kind of bricolage that I was talking about um, uh, when I described the Machiavellian notion. Now, let's look at the Japanese left. Every, as everyone knows, the Japanese left is not driving the national bus. The Japanese left, the joke is left. Um, but in its opposition, it does deploy its own characteristic historical metaphor, uh, what I, I will refer to as the slippery slope. Uh, invocation of a slippery slope uh, has been ubiquitous in the two most contested issues of this year, 2014, uh, that is collective self-defense and uh, the designated state secrets uh, legislation. So let me take each in turn. Most of the folks on the left vigorously oppose the interpretation, the reinterpretation uh, of the Constitution to allow uh, Japan to engage in collective self-defense, by which is meant simply the authorization of the Japanese military to assist allies, allied nations, um, that come under attack. Uh, I think a lot of Americans are surprised to learn that we have an ally that can't come to our defense when we're under attack. Um, I don't know how the feeling is here. Well, you don't have the same kind of alliance, I suppose. But it is kind of shocking to a lot of Americans that it is such an unre unreciprocal uh, or imbalanced uh, relationship. But the fact is that collective self-defense has been in the works and actually has been de facto in practice for a long time, over a decade, in my view, over a decade now, uh, ever since Prime Minister Koizumi uh, uh, first dispatched the, mar the maritime self-defense forces um, to fuel U.S. and British fighters that were flying sorties in Afghanistan from Diego Garcia. Um, opponents to collective self-defense, nonetheless, that was without any reinterpretation, of course, but opponents insist that collective self-defense would open the floodgates uh, to a revival of Japanese militarism, uh, to undermine constitutional governance. Uh, despite a long history of prime ministerial directives for the reinterpretation uh, of the Constitution, opponents insisted that collective self-defense was different and it required a, a fuller, more, uh, more engaged debate on its constitutionality. And I think a lot of people were sympathetic to that, to that notion. Um, but a more urgent concern was also expressed uh, to, to collective self-defense among the opponents, which is the impact of that reinterpretation on national security in Japan itself. The headlines in the Tokyo Shimbun uh, blared that Japan was now on the road to war. The Asahi Shimbun editorialized that Prime Minister Abe was in a, quote, headlong rush, unquote, to change Japan's military. Mainichi called it, quote, unquote, reckless, uh, adding that once the self-defense forces launch operations, uh, there will be no limit to what they can do. And what these opponents have in common, the opponents to collective self-defense have in common, is uh, at base a lack of confidence, uh, I think, in the Japanese military, or at least a lack of confidence in the ability of political leaders to control the Japanese military. For them, Japan, as ever, teeters uh, on the edge of a slippery slope toward mid-century militarism. Uh, and I think this is simply wrong, and uh, we can talk about that. I hope we'll talk about that in some, at some length. But, but that's, the, that's this, this, the, the opposition to the, to the uh, collective self-defense, the slippery slopers. They also reappear, but with a twist, in the debate over the designated state secrets law um, that will take effect next month, um, which, which centered really on the proper balance between the debate did, between secrecy uh, and policy transparency. And it animated, as I say, the same adversaries uh, that, uh, that I've been talking about along many of the same battle lines uh, and has generated many of the same dynamics, including many of the same historical metaphors. Uh, the law itself extends the power to classify documents and sort of makes uniform throughout and across 19 agencies and ministries in the Japanese state the ability to classify documents beyond the Ministry of Defense uh, and stipulates that the designation of secrets in four specific areas. Uh, in, in defense, there already was a law on secrecy in the defense, but it includes, it added diplomacy, uh, espionage, and terrorism. Uh, the period of designation of a, of a state secret uh, can be up to 60 years or even longer. That's, that's after renewals and so forth and, and actions by the cabinet. Uh, 
to extend. And the point here now is that any minister, any of these 19 chief executives of any of these agencies or ministries now can designate a state secret and, re and even refuse to divulge them to the Diet, to the Japanese parliament, uh, if they believe that a leaked secret might damage national security. Now, again, some opponents to the, to the law and to that legislation resorted immediately to the slippery slope argument. Um, the Mainichi reminded its readers that although the government promised its readers uh, it promised in the 1940s that the military secrets protection law would not affect the lives of ordinary citizens. Um, even photography clubs and weather forecasts uh, were violated and raided. Uh, weather forecasts were suspended for four years. Mainichi editorialists then said that Prime Minister Abe's reassurances, and there were many by the Prime Minister, to protect the freedom of the press and to protect whistleblowers um, were merely an echo of what, we, what they heard from the imperial military, again, in the 1930s, suggesting Japan was, was right now, again, on that same, same path. Legal scholars uh, declared that the law aims to silence pacifists by returning to the unpleasant wartime society of mutual suspicion uh, and sort of mutual surveillance and intimidation. Um, but, and here's the twist, um, there were a great many other objections to the state secrets, the designated state secrets law beyond the slippery slope, including concerns about press freedom, concerns about arbitrary classification, concerns about privacy, independent mon the need for an independent monitor, and so forth. Uh, and each was not pegged, those, those objections were not pegged to Japan's, the particularities of Japan's wartime past or the militarism that somehow would be would, would somehow return, um, but in fact were pegged uh, to universal principles that were proclaimed earlier in 2013 in South Africa uh, by the open source, I'm sorry, the open society um, or um, NGO conference in Schwane, the Schwane principles. Um, so these were, it was a shift from particularism to universalism that I thought was really stunning and not something I expected to discover as I began reviewing uh, the, the discourse and the debate over state secrets. So here's the change. The slippery slope argument not only failed to win the day, um, the, uh, the bad joke is they didn't get any traction. Stick with me, guys. Um, um, as they did in 1985, they are sleeping. Um, as they did in 1985 when they just, cr they, they just crushed a similar um, uh, initiative by Prime Minister Nakasone at the time. Um, but it was rejected, that is the slippery slope argument was rejected as excessive even by many opponents of the designated state secrets law. Some of the most prominent opponents of the law uh, were, were uh, they, they dismissed the comparisons to the pre-war as irrelevant um, to contemporary Japan where they said civil society had sunk very, uh, very robust roots, democratic values and, and, and so forth. Um, existed and were healthy and, and so forth. Their view was that the legislation could be improved and some of the opponents from the Federation, the, the Bar, National Bar Association, so they joined the effort to set the draft that had been written by the government right. So the opponents joined, uh, they accepted the idea of state secrets and they rejected uh, the slippery slope argument that I expected to find dominating. Interestingly, the Japanese public uh, accepted the need for a st stronger state secret regime, but did not respond well to strong arm tactics um, in the diet or end runs around the constitution. Uh, Prime Minister Abe's support, you may remember, Prime Minister Abe's support dropped sharply um, uh, after both the designated state secrets law and collective self-defense were rammed through diet or through the cabinet in the case of this, this collective self-defense. And I believe, and this is really where the lessons are to be drawn for domestic politics, I believe it's because there exists in Japan a large and a moderate uh, and an unpoliticized uh, and a persuadable middle um, in Japan. Um, be, and because like citizens everywhere, uh, Japanese individuals and groups identify with a shifting range of appeals uh, at different times and to varying extents they've embraced notions, this is, this is really uh, something derived from work that our, our colleague Patrick Boyd has done in his really magisterial dissertation. Um, they, they, they've embraced notions of post-war Japan as a peace state, 
uh, as a democratic state, as a technology-based nation, as a modern state, as a small island trading nation, as a divine nation. There are lots of ways to think about Japan, and often people do that simultaneously. They're persuadable, they're moderate, and they're, they've got ears. Um, my takeaway, then, is that on this point is that Japanese national identity um, is itself a matter of change. A construction that under, undergoes constant reconstruction, therefore, takes many forms, as I say, often simultaneously. Now, this is, I think, especially the case with voters today, where the numbers uh, and the vigor of independence has never been higher uh, than it is in Japan. So what I'm suggesting is that even with the optimism over the possibilities for rebirth after 311 that's, that have now dissipated, um, the two backward-looking perspectives, uh, the rearview mirror and the slippery slope, have each been vulnerable to, uh, to amendment by a fairly vigorous, uh, fairly vigilant center um, in Japan. On my reading and on my listening at least, both are being forced toward the center and have been forced toward the center, away from an exclusive focus on all the bad things that history has held. For the left, it was militarism, and for the right, it was defeat. Uh, the center listens to both, but seems more comfortable slicing the edges uh, and the, rough, the roughness off of, off of each. Uh, so now when it comes to policy change, the national debate is vigorous. Uh, it's future-oriented. It's increasingly being contested on universal grounds by a public that's more independent and I think less ideological than it has been uh, in the past. Now, I want to end by suggesting how the use of history uh, in Japan relates to Sino-Japanese relations, because I promised you I would, and I think I still have a couple more minutes to do this, uh, because I think this is where change seems most, uh, most consequential, uh, at least for this audience and for the audiences I speak to in the United States. China, thinking now about rearview mirrors and slippery slopes, China benefits from uh, both narratives. It benefits both from the fear by some uh, Japanese of militarism and by the loathing of defeat by other uh, Japanese. Slippery slope arguments coming out of the left are fully consistent with Chinese preferences, uh, and revisionism by the right allows China to depict Japan as a wolf in sheep's clothing. In contrast, um, each uh, also, uh, I mean, each alienates the American ally as well. Both of these. I mean, it's a contrast. For the Chinese, it both benefit um, the Chinese view. Um, the United States both alienate the American side. Revisionism reminds Americans that Japan was their enemy and China was their ally in the good war, the war that the Americans call the good war. And the slippery slope reminds Americans uh, how unequal its alliance is, um, as I said before, with Japan, and makes some question uh, Japan's commitment to it. Uh, I think there are costs if the United States is alienated. I'm not a fan of the United States as Globocop, that's for sure. But I do think it continues to have a positive role to play in the region, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis Sino Japanese relations, relations which uh, more than ever are being battered about by competing historical narratives. History is being used by leaders in both countries, now I'm talking in the, bi in the bilateral context, uh, to royal domestic politics at home which drives, I think, risky po foreign policy choices. Uh, the actual dynamic, though, really is not bilateral. It's triangular. Um, and, and, and Washington looms large in both Beijing's and Tokyo's uh, strategies. The United States is China's top market, Japan's second largest, and the United States has, I think, um, it is not unfair to say, been a stabilizing force forward deployed in Northeast Asia for decades. It's been other things, but it's been that too. Uh, but the rise of China, um, perforce, means the relative decline of the United States, um, a much, de much diminished 900-pound gorilla uh, with a much diminished desire to beat uh, its chest. And this changes things. Uh, the most familiar metaphor, they're going to talk about two metaphors, then I'm going to end, but the most familiar metaphor here uh, that's currently in play is, regarding all of this is known as the pivot, uh, a.k.a. the rebalance. Um, the United States is cutting its defense budget. It has no choice. Um, folks here in Asia are understandably eager to know if the United States is going to cut and pivot or the United States is going to cut and run um, and accept its relatively diminished capacity to make a difference. And I, I'm sorry to report that Congress isn't 
any more sure than anyone else, uh, than anyone out here in the, re in the region. Multiple hearings, you know, you read the, the, um, uh, the reports on these hearings, uh, they don't seem to have clarified exactly what's in motion. Moreover, since allies have a tendency to entangle one another, we know that from you know, International Relations 101, um, while everyone is focused on how to deal with the Chinese power, Washington, on how to deal with rising Chinese power, Washington uh, may be just as unsure about how to deal with an independent and assertive Japan. Japan's hedging. Uh, that was a, another book I wrote. The previous book is all about the Japanese hedge, but Japan's hedging, and it's a natural response. It's a perfectly rational, realist response to uncertainty. Um, and as one colleague suggested, um, Japan uh, may be using the alliance to transcend the alliance. Uh, that's, that's a concern. But I have another metaphor to offer, and, and it, that's the metaphor not of the pivot, but of the ja of jazz music, and ja the jazz player. A few years back, my wife and I and a group of Japanese friends uh, attended a concert in the Bunkamura in Shibuya, some of you know the theater, uh, that featured two really brilliant musicians. One uh, was a Japanese shamisen player, uh, the other was a Chinese erhu player. They're both are stringed instruments. I'm sure you're all familiar with these instruments. And each made wonderful, individually, each made wonderful music on their, on their instrument. But when they tried to play together, um, just the two of them, they failed pretty, and they failed pretty, pretty miserably. The music was harsh. It was discordant. I, it wasn't to my taste, as my wife likes to remind me. It wasn't to my taste. But as it turned out, each of these very talented young musicians had studied jazz, one in New Orleans and one in Chicago. So they had two different kinds of jazz, but they both had studied jazz. Um, and at the, the very the, the final piece in the concert, um, a, a, a curtain went up in the back of the, way in the back uh, of the auditorium, and it revealed a piano. And a piano player you could barely make out in the shadows just came out and started doing jazz riffs on the piano. Um, and the three of them together generated some of the most moving and extraordinary music I have ever heard in my life. It was, it was fabulous, but it wasn't just the music. I walked out of there, beyond the music, it was the metaphor. It was the, the following idea, that Americans can help the Japanese and the Chinese uh, engage one another. I know this is cheap, but it's true. <laughs> they can engage each other innovatively, they can engage each other on their own terms and productively without the Americans dominating the discourse. Without the Americans dominating the discourse. The result was a, was a common, I'd like to say historically grounded, widely embraced vernacular. We provided a vernacular, but they did the music. Um, and it was a public good. And it seems to me the metaphor is that this kind of public good could be created uh, in the region and the rest of the world might benefit. And I, respect, I, I suspect that getting there uh, would require leaders who will find and define and build upon uh, common ground uh, that's cemented by sh a shared, shared historical tropes. And we've seen that the non-strategic use of history uh, is getting less traction in Japan. That was the first part of my remarks. If you're not gonna use, if you're gonna try to do history through the rear view mirror or talk about slippery, it's not gonna, you're not going anywhere, it's not strategic. Um, um, but we are looking for leaders who would use history strategically rather than opportunistic leaders, leader, uh, opportunistically, leaders who would craft a productive future, uh, not just flicking uh, at, at repeatedly at unpleasant, unpleasant pasts. And speaking of that past, I think it's worth returning to it um, for a moment, as it was, not as it's constructed. It has to be constructed. But for a moment, let's return to it as it was. Uh, I wonder if Washington is going to reprise the role of Great Britain in 1896. Um, if so, uh, you'd want to read uh, the, uh, the diary of Mutsu, Mune, Mune Mitsu's remarks. I mean, his remarks, his diary about Britain and Sino-Japanese competition. They seem as apt today as they did in the, uh, the late 19th century. He was Japan's foreign minister in 1895 at the time of the first Sino-Japanese war and described Great Britain acting out Japan's worst fears for, Jap for the United States today. Uh, in particular, the possibility 
of a US PRC G2. Now, I know some in, in Australia are advocating it, some in the United States are advocating this kind of G2. Um, this is the way he was seeing um, the relationship uh, as between Britain and, and, uh, and China. And he wrote in his diary that Britain was chiefly concerned so substitute the US for Britain, substitute Washington for Lon uh, London for Washington, or Washington for London, that it was concerned about the possible rupture of peace in the Far East and was willing to play an active role in attempting to mediate, uh, but did not appear, did not appear to have, the, this is a direct quote from Mutsut, did not appear to have the resolve to, that was necessary to intervene with force in case its position was rejected. The British, he said, quote, were resigned to their inability to prevent what had finally become an inevitable war between China and Japan. Britain was carried away by fear about the possible disruption uh, of her commercial interests in the Far East. Now, I don't want to end with an admittedly lame plus à change. Uh, that's, not, that's not the way to end the speech. Um, but Mutsu's focus on the distant and declining uh, great powers' interest and in stability uh, and commerce certainly seems to point in the direction of past as prologue. Uh, and what's not yet clear is whether or not leaders will have learned from that uh, and will emerge in the region who will find, define, and build upon a common ground um, that's cemented by an enduring effort that requires that uh, to, to, to build upon and to identify a shared common history. Given the, mill the millennia of Sino-Japanese interactions, this shouldn't be impossible. Uh, if they find the positive history to use uh, and the right sort of improvised music certainly would not hurt those chances, uh, that would be, I think, the most welcome and positive uh, change of all. So I, I will stop with that and thank you very much for the chance to share some of these thoughts and look forward to a larger conversation. Professor Samuels, I wonder if I could ask you to live slightly dangerously and tell us what you think you would see in 2020 when you looked in the rear view mirror. Uh, would you see an Abe government that had not achieved as much as you had wanted? and uh, not as much as you expected? That's a fabulous question. Um, and I'm not prepared to answer it in a way that convinces myself, much less you, but I'll give it a try. Um, 2020, fortunately for me, trying to answer it, 2020 is close enough to 2014 um, that, uh, that I don't have to imagine high, medium, and low scenarios going out 15 or 20 years. Um, so let's imagine then, make a couple of assumptions. We have to make some assumptions. So the assumption is that the Chinese economy doesn't collapse. Uh, China continues to, uh, to, to uh, grow, at least moderately. Um, there's stability. The party uh, uh, consolidates further its power. That Japan um, comes to a, um, a consensus on uh, the relevance, importance, legitimacy of national security at a level beyond what, what we've seen in the past. I expect that, and I think Prime Minister Abe and, um, and his associates get a lot of credit for that, should get a lot of credit for that, but it pre predates them, as I say. Collective self-defense goes back to Mr. Koizumi and maybe even earlier. But we've seen over time um, an enhancement of the legitimacy of, of national security in Japan. I think 311 had that effect, too. So a, a more confident uh, Japan with a more legitimate military uh, and a United States that learns um, its limits. That's the toughest assumption of all to make because I'm not sure the United States is capable of learning its limits and that's very troubling. But if the United States learns its limits on those other two things come to be, I think we'll continue to have a balance in the region uh, and stability in the region. Um, it's going to require a more muscular Japan, not necessarily a more independent one. But if the United States um, cuts and runs, uh, then, then you're going to have a, a much more difficult 2020 looking back will be, you'll say, when America cut and run, that was the beginning 
of, a, of a very nasty arms race and, uh, and the rise of a, what the Japanese call jishuboe, of an independent defense um, where, where the alliance matters little um, and, um, and uh, uh, independent national security matters most. That's, a, that's an unstable solution in the near term. That would, be, that would be some of the assumptions, the things I'd be looking for. Thanks very much, Professor Samuels. Um, where are you? Here I am. Right. <laughs> um, my question probably picks up just where you finished. Um, for the lovely metaphor of the jazz players to work with the US playing a, um, a non-dominant role in helping those two powers to get along, what would the US have to do uh, in practical terms or do differently in practical terms for that to happen? Right. Um, I think the United States, uh, that's, that's all, these are all wonderful questions. What would it have to do differently? Um, well, it, wouldn't, it, it should not cut and run. Okay? It, should, it should make good on its promise to rebalance in the region. It should stay, it should reassure its Japanese ally. This is a difficult thing because your reassured Japanese allies, like any alliance, is about reassurance. And um, the, the Japanese ally has been, uh, on most accounts, the, one of the more needy, uh, of, uh, more needy of, of reassurance, uh, whether it's because of extended deterrence um, or for whatever other reason. Um, I think the United States has to continue reassuring um, its Japanese ally. And in reassuring its Japanese ally, it needs to remind the Chinese that it means it. It has to, tell, it has to tell both. That it means that it's that it's here to stay because they're uh, that, that they're wanted in the region. They, you know, this is where Australia comes in. A lot, a lot of the countries in the region um, come in. Uh, we go down from the East China Sea, where most of us are paying close attention, to the South China Sea, and um, and understand how desirous of an American presence um, the region the region is. I recall when Secretary Clinton came out here and um, made that speech. Um, when the Chinese went apoplectic in her presence. And, um, but it was, it was the beginning of this new balancing game. And you know, I, I hate to keep invoking sort of these straight up realist balance of power kinds of, of metaphors, but I think they're, they're important. And I think they're not, just, they're not uh, at all conceptually empty. Um, and you also know that given my talk, I also think about things like national identity. But from an American perspective, um, I think it's, it's critical that we say what we mean and mean what we say. Thank you, Professor, uh, for sharing your views. My name is Taka. Uh, my question is about um, Japan-China relations that you touched upon uh, in your last part. Uh, how do you see or evaluate the recent development? Uh, both China and Japanese side are trying really hard to improve the relationships. Uh, recently, there was a maritime talk held in China uh, between Japan and China, and they talk about how to Establish crisis management mechanism. This dialogue hasn't been held for a long time, but at last it was held. And also recently, Japanese business delegation went to Beijing and met with Deputy Premier, and they had a good discussion. So I can see that there is this positive movement on the efforts of, on both sides, Japan and China. How do you evaluate this? This is my question. Thank you. Well, um, as a card-carrying political scientist, you won't be surprised to know that I'm kind of cynical about that um, in the following sense. Um, it wasn't hard to predict, you didn't need a crystal ball to predict that efforts would be made um, starting in the late summer and into the fall this year um, to find ways for um, some level of softening reconciliation leading to potentially a meeting on the, at, at the, it's the APEC meeting in China. China is the host, it's coming up. So China has every incentive to, um, uh, to soften, not quite go back to its smiley face and you know, benign rise, but to sort of close its mouth and, and sort of hide the, the, uh, the, snarly, the snarly part uh, that, that it had become, or at least it seemed to become to the Japanese. Um, so it's not a surprise. And there's history here. The history that I'm most familiar with, I put in this book, was the way in which China and Japan had a temporary reconciliation in 2008. 
first of all, Mr. Fukuda was prime minister in the spring of 2008. Um, he is and has good relations with the Chinese and always has. But um, beyond that, uh, something was happening. And you'll remember in the summer of 2008, which was the, the Olympics in Beijing. And in, in May, um, Chinese leadership comes to Japan. Um, they're welcomed. Uh, this is in the wake of a very nasty set of, of, of incidents starting really in 2004 in the Asian football championships when there were riots when the Japanese beat the, the, uh, the Chinese team for the championship and so forth. Anyway, the point is um, that they began this reconciliation with an eye toward uh, uh, the summer uh, Olympics and then something quite extraordinary happened was the Sichuan quake two weeks later. And with this, this, the devastation of the Sichuan quake was an opportunity for both the Chinese and the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese immediately offered to help. The Chinese immediately accepted it. And the first foreign country to send relief workers to China came from Japan. This is in the wake of some very nasty, uh, nasty relations. Anyway, um, they were treated well. They were treated with respect. They treated the 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 uh, victims with respect um, were lauded uh, by the Chinese public, which followed every step because the, uh, the Chinese television and newspapers followed them every step of the way throughout their rescue and relief mission. Um, so that, as it happened in the summer of 2008, uh, when, the Chinese, when the Japanese team marched onto the pitch in the bird's nest, they got a standing ovation from the Chinese fans. This was unbelievable, right? Well, it didn't take 18 months before it all came apart again. And, and we were in the Senkaku's Diaoyu dispute in, 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 in a very big way. So these things, so I become cynical knowing the history, um, knowing that, that this reconciliation, this attempted reconciliation that you described was gonna happen. Everyone knew it would be efforts. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure that it's, that it's the kind of stuff on which lasting reconciliation, deep reconciliation, is made, unfortunately. So political discussion continues in a moment with our panel. But at this point, for saying what he means, let's thank Professor Richardson. <laughs>